Don't buy the hype. Starting in, cha starting in verse 8, 2 Kings chapter 19. So Rabshaki returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Lebna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And when he had heard say of Kirkea, king of Ethiopia, behold, he has come out to fight against thee, he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard that the kings of Assyria have done all to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shall thou be delivered. Have the God of the nations delivered them, which thy fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, and Reza, and the children of Eden, to whom are, to whom which are in Thilazar? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharzin, or of Ivan, or Hena? And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, and all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thy ear, and hear open, Lord, thy eyes, and see and hear the words of Shennacherib, which has sent him a reproach to the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands. Wood and stone, therefore, they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save us thou out of the hand, and all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the God, even thou only. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you, Lord God, for this day. We ask you, Lord, that you would be with us. Father, this 445 is meaningless unless, Lord God, you come and you visit us. Holy Spirit, unless you flow up and out the pews of this chapel and have your way with every heart, it's all in vain. Lord, I pray that you'd come, that you would be with us today, that you would fill my heart with the words that you want me to say as your vessel, as your conduit, Lord. I pray that you touch every heart here, including mine. Lord, I believe that we're in the 11th hour of your return, Lord. I believe the time is short. I believe the harvest is done. And Lord, I just ask you right now, Lord God, that you would do a mighty work here today. I pray for a special anointing, not only upon myself, but for everyone that is here, Lord, that you'd anoint their ears to be able to hear what you have to say, Lord. And I pray that your name be highly lifted up, exalted. It's in your holy name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. I um, was looking in the statistics of the uh, New England Patriots. I don't know if you guys follow football. But in 2007, they went 16-0. and And they went 16-0, and and they won the, the, the divisional playoffs. They won the... Uh, conference championship game against the Chargers and they were headed for the Super Bowl and you may remember I don't know if it was Bill Belichick I don't know who it was but they were holding the newspaper 18 and 0 and it seemed like for sure that that Super Bowl was going to be theirs that they were going to just be able to take the Giants on and beat them because they were just doing so good that whole year and they were taunting and they were going back and forth and they were just all sorts of hype going on. And then you just may remember that in that Super Bowl, how the Giants beat them 17 to 14. And they lost. We have a similar situation here today where we have a man by the name of Reb Shaki who was the cupbearer. He was the messenger for King Shadakarib of Assyria. And he 
had come in and several, out, out several times to Judah and had tried to explain to Judah and to the king, Hezekiah, that Shennacherib was going to win. The kings of Assyria were going to march into Jerusalem and they were going to win and that there was nothing that they were going to be able to do to be able to win that battle because the king of Assyria had done battle with all these other countries, had wiped everybody off the map, and that they were going to come in. So the messengers had uh, went to Isaiah and they said, hey, we've, we've heard the reports from the messenger of the king of Assyria that Israel was going to get wiped out, that there was no way we were going to win. And they went to Isaiah, and Isaiah said in verse 6, unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, that which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon them, and he shall hear a rumor, and, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fail by his own sword in his own land. And so the Lord had heard the rumor. He had heard the fact that the uh, messengers of Assyria had come in and said, there's no way you're going to win. That we were, we've defeated all these other things. And in fact, what was touching God so much is that they were able to say so much of the, in verse 10, thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, say, not let thy God, your God, the God of all creation, into whom thou trust deceive thee. The messenger of the king of Assyria had the audacity to come in and, and to keep on bringing the hype in that they were going to get wiped out and don't put your trust in this God, that the God of creation, the God of all time, don't put your trust in him. And we know that Psalm 25, 2 and 3 says, Oh my God, I will trust in thee. Let not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, yet, yea, not, not will wait upon thee, be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. In Psalm 25, David knew what it was like to have trouble. He knew what it was like to have People coming against him to try to overtake him, to overpower him. He knew what it was like to have enemies. But David said, you know what? I put my trust in God. Because if I can't put my trust in God to be able to win the battle for me, there's no one else that's going to win it for me. Because if God can be for me, who will be against me? And so he knew that he could trust God. He knew that God would give him the answer. And no man should be ashamed that puts their trust in God. In Isaiah 49 and 23, And all kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens by nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces toward earth, and lick up the dust of the feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. God says, you trust me, even when it looks like there's no end to it. When you're being taunted, when you're being, when all the hype is coming at you, that there's no way you're going to win, that you're going to lose. When everything's coming against you, the Lord says, that may be what the world is saying, and it may be what the world is thinking, but they have forgotten one major factor in their equation. I am God. I hold all things together. I sustain everything, and I'm going to receive the glory for what's going to take place. And God was being mocked by this messenger of Assyria. And the, the Assyrian came in in verse 10 and said, Don't put your trust in God. You're a fool for trusting God. But it's the very thing that God calls us to. It's the very thing that God trusts us to. In Psalm 20, 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation. At that time, Hezekiah was a godly king. He loved the Lord, and because he loved the Lord, they were blessed. 
He tore down all the idols and all the thrones of the idols. He cast all of the evil spirits and everything that was there in the altars. He tore them all down. And he again, beginning to sing and praise the worship leaders into the temple, began to praise God 24-7, 365, and started up everything for the praise of God's glory. Was he perfect? No. But this is, was his intention, that he was going to have a godly country. And because he had a godly country, all the other countries were being wiped out. And it was rightly put by King Hezekiah. It was rightly put, as he said in his early verses. In verse 17, of a truth, Lord, the king of Assyria has destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods with the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. That is true. And King Hezekiah wasn't looking at a false reality. He wasn't looking at a, a false truth. He acknowledges to the best of his ability to know that these kings have destroyed all these other lands. That it is true that they were able to wipe them out. And every war that they fought into, every war the king of Assyrians were fighting into, they took the land. And they ran over countries. And they wiped them out totally. And it seemed like Israel was a little speck on the earth compared to all the other nations. And they were sure to get wiped out by every human reasoning. But wait a minute. They had God on their side. You see, God plus you equals a win. It don't matter how many people are on the other side. It don't matter what you're up against. It don't matter what you're facing. You could be truthful with God and say, God, I know that this enemy that I am against, they're able to do all these things. And surely there was no mistake that they were. He, he didn't have some misconception of who God was. Amen. He didn't have no misconception who his enemies were. But he just knew the power of God. He just knew the integrity of God. He just knew that his God was able to sustain him and that through God this country was going to be able to make it. Amen? Amen. He knew that they were going to make it. I had look here in verse 14 when Hezekiah received the letter in the hand of the messengers. He read it. And King Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I can't tell you how many times I have personally have done that with people. I have a good friend of mine that was going through a divorce. His wife was committing adultery. He was fighting for custody of his kids. And he received all these threatening letters from the attorney, from the courts and everything. And he said, Brother Mike, what do I do? What do I do? I said, brother, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take all your letters. We're going to open them up. We're going to set them on your dining room table, like King Hezekiah did here in this verse. And we're going to put it before the Lord. We're not in the house of God. We're not in the house of the Lord. We're in your dining room, but the Lord will respect that. Because you love the Lord, because you know and you honor him. And we did. We did exactly that. We put his letters right before the Lord. And him and I kneeled down, we prayed. We said, God, you are the God most high. Of a truth, these bills are what they are. The situation is what it is. God, you know the whole scenario. You know how it's all being played out. But God, we cry out for your mercy. We pray out for your grace to be able to help my brother here who's facing all these difficulties taken on by something that wasn't even his fault. And can I tell you, it wasn't so much long after that that God worked through every one of those letters. Every single one. Did it all turn out exactly the way he wanted to? No. No, it was, there were some up and downs. But eventually, in the end, all the letters were answered, and God had answered the prayer to every letter. Was it hard? Was it a struggle? Yes. But you see, my friend, did something that I did. We trusted in the Lord. We trusted God's provision. We trusted God's grace. We trusted his mercy was going to endure. And that the enemies were not going to take the upper hand. 
Yes, it seems like for a while they will. And it seems like for a while that they're going to do what they're going to do. But we know that we serve a God who is awesome in every way. We serve a God who is able to do mighty things. I was looking in Psalm 18, in 46 and 48. It says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avenges me and subdueth the people under me. David understood that in the time of battle, in the time of heat, it was the Lord that was going to subdue his enemy. King Hezekiah knew that from King David, that the Lord was going to sustain him, that the Lord was going to move on behalf of him. In Micah 7 and 9 and 10, it says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pled my cause, plead my cause, and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Then my enemy will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said unto me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her downfall. Even now she will be trampled underfoot like mere in the streets. You know that these, these enemies of God shake their fist at him and they shake their fist at us and they want to take you down so bad and, and it seems like they're going to win and they taunt you and they taunt you and they taunt you. But God says, I'm not worried about them. God says, I've got your back. And yes, don't buy the hype. Don't buy the hype because everything they're throwing at you isn't going to stick. Don't buy the hype because I'm stronger than whatever's coming your way. And the enemy of your soul and mind wants to put fear into our hearts, wants us to put doubt into our lives that God is who he is. But you, you, you should not have fear and you should not have doubt because God is who he is. And if you've got God on your side and you trusted him like I had read here in the Psalms, as David had trusted him, as King Hezekiah had trusted him, you will get through. But the enemy of your soul and mind wants to create doubt. And he'll say things over and over and over and over to create doubt in your mind. And you just got to keep on coming back to him with the promises of God. In Psalms 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people who has chosen him for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation. And so we read and we understand that God is that person. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not be, shall not make haste. You believe in Jesus. You really believe in Christ. And you not only believe in him, but you have faith to know that he's going to get you through. You not only know who Jesus is, but you know him intimately. And you say, God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of my situation. I don't know how I'm going to get through these enemies that are combining me and, and trying to bring all this hype upon me. But I know this, Lord, if I just keep on walking through the valley of the shadow of doubt, death, I know you're going to get me through the other side. Because all it is is doubt. All it is is hype. And gentlemen, I, I've said this before, and I'll say it a million times, 90% of the things that we worry about never come to fruition. I've heard it, that statistic from more than one source, it just never happens. But if there's doubt, if there's fear putting into our hearts, the devil's got us right where he wants us. But I'm here today to tell you that there is power in the name of the Lord. There is power in trusting him. He is our shield. He is our buckler. He'll get us through as he did with Hezekiah, as he did with Judah, and as he did with many others in countless situations to those who have been in the same situations. In Samuel, 2 Samuel in 22, going back, I'm going to read a couple more verses to you about what King David had understood about his enemies and about the enemies that came against him. 2 Samuel in 22, it's 
just want to read a couple of those verses to you. In 2 Samuel 22, in verse 3, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. This is what David said, I'm going to trust him. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, thou shalt save me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. David trusted in the Lord. Just like King Hezekiah, I'm trusting in the Lord. You know, the messenger of the king of Assyria, Shennacherib, came and he was mocking Judah. He was mocking Hezekiah because he trusted in God. And that directly affects God. And as I had read in verses 6 and 7 of first, uh, second, second Kings uh, 19, that was a, that was a, 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 that was a, a hype against uh, the Lord of himself. That was a direct insult against God. Because God made the promise, if you trust me, you'll never fail. If you trust me, I'll see you through. And when the messenger came and said, don't trust that God, he's going to fail you. God says, no, now you're, now you're hitting on me. But you see, when you're one of God's children, he's got his eye upon you. When you're one of God's children, he watches for you. When, he, when somebody insults you and the enemies are coming against you, you're his. You're God's child. And he's not going to let the enemies overrun you and overtake one of his own children. But later on, David has this to say in verses 18 and 19. He delivered me from, from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me to the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighteth in me. The Lord is your strength. The Lord is your strong tower. The Lord is your shield. The Lord is your buckler. The Lord is your stay, as David said. His enemies were defeated not because David had any strength, because he admitted to us in these verses that he personally didn't have the strength, but he relied upon his God. He relied upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's what Hezekiah was doing in his verses. He understood that the king of Assyria was wiping different countries out, that they were overtaking them. But he says back in 2 Kings 19, But therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of the hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Show, Lord God, your glory. Show your glory in this situation that you're going to defeat these enemies, that you are a real God. You're just not somebody that we read about in the pages of a book called the Bible, that he's just not somebody that comes to be able to be preached about, but that he takes shoe leather, that he takes on the form of uh, somebody that you actually can witness and see that he indeed is true. <coughs> that intimately, that personally in your life, that he does something to it to change it. And that he's concerned about who you are. He's concerned about the things that happen in your life. Because in verse 15, it says that Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. He said, O God of Israel, which draws between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. You see, Hezekiah knew that he was trusting in not just an idol. He was not trusting in just something that the other nations had trusted. But he was trusting in the Lord God himself. He was trusting in somebody that was with them. When he said that you dwell between the cherubims, he knew that the Ark of the Covenant was there. He knew that God was there in his very presence. He knew that he was not going into battle by himself, but he was going into battle with the Lord. And as he went into the battle with the Lord, he knew that battle was going to be won, not because he thought he could do it on his own, but because he had every amount of faith and trust and belief that God was going to get him through. Amen? Amen. 
So if you read down 2 Kings 19, if you go down to verse 35, this is the, the end of what happens in this particular passage. We, we had read in verse 6 and 7 of this passage that God had predicted, as we had read, that the king of Assyria was going was to go back to his own country and that he was going to die, right? We read that, and so here we are. Back in second, back in Second Kings, and I'll get to there right now. Second Kings nineteen, and this is what we learn, starting in verse thirty-five. And it says, "And it came to pass that night. This is the night when the Assyrians were all camped out. They were, were they were wanting to attack Judah. That the angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians." And a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Shennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned to dwell in Nineveh, just as the Lord said he would. The Lord said that he would go back, and he did. The, the, the fulfillment of verse 6 has happened here in verse 36. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Neshrop, his god, that Adrimelech and Sherazar, his son, smote him with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Arhadon, his son, reigned in his stead. You see, the Lord said that the Syrians were not going to take over, the Lord said that the king would die at his own sword. The king would not return, well, would not would return, but would die. And he died by the hands of his own two sons. Here he was wiping out all these countries. And here his message bearer, messenger kept on coming to Jude and said, just give up, give us your land. Just give up, don't put a fight. Kept on coming back and kept on giving Judah the hype. Just give up. And Judah stood steadfast, not on their own feet, but on the feet of Jesus Christ. Not on their own feet saying, well, we should just cave in because, oh, they're, oh God, you know, you know that this, this uh, Shernachrab has been taking over all these other countries, been wiping them out. We ought to really just cave in and just give them what they want. But you see, Hezekiah said, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to do what the other countries did. They had a false god. They didn't have a real god. Their gods were made out of hay, wood, and stubble, and they all went up in flames. They weren't real. But Hezekiah says, I'm not serving that god. I'm not serving the god of the idols of the other nations. I'm serving the one true, holy, and mighty god. I'm serving one who created all the heavens and the earth, hangs them all in the bounds. I'm, hey, I'm holding on to this Bible here. I praise God for this Bible because I know that my Lord inspired it and wrote it. I know that when I'm in the time of temptation, I know that when I'm in the time of trouble, I know when my enemies are coming to get me, I know that there are promises in this word of God. They're going to keep me. Yes. Praise God for his word. Amen. Amen. If I didn't have this holy, infallible word of God, I wouldn't know what to do in my time of calamity. I wouldn't know what to do when it seems like every enemy is against me. I wouldn't have the foggiest idea. But I could read from the book of Genesis all the way to the end of the book, and I know that we win if we are in Christ. But I also know this from reading the word of God as I read it today. I know those of you who don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're not connected with the Lord God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you're not linked to him by the new birth, if you're not saved by him, if you're not a part of his family, I know this, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, I know you're going to get wiped out. 
Because that's exactly what the king of Assyria was doing to all these heathen nations. Those that didn't have Jesus, those that didn't have God protecting them, those that didn't have God as their God of their land, were wiped out. If your God is, hey, wood and stubble, the king of Assyria, wipe them all out, the devil's going to wipe them all out. That's just plain English. But you have a time today to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I repent from living my life my way. I'm tired, Lord God, of living it with the false idols that I've had in my own life. I want to take on the true Lord God of heaven. I want to repent of my sins. I want to repent of my life. I want to come to you and know you as Lord and Savior. I want the one true God so that when the enemy comes into me, I can say it like David the psalmist did. I can say it like Isaiah did in the book of Isaiah. I can say as King Hezekiah did when he was penning these words. I know that my God reigns. And in him, he will get me through all things. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you, Lord. We thank you for this lesson. Don't buy the hype. We thank you, Lord God, that no matter what it may seem like that the enemy is coming at us with, we just need to hang on. We just need to get through. We just need to maintain. We don't have to give in to the hype. We don't have to give in to the temptations of the devil. We don't have to believe that everything is rosy and peachy in our lives, Lord God, when it's not. But Lord God, whatever the letter is, whatever it is that we're going through, if we have Jesus in our lives, if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we can make it through. And Lord, I pray for these who do not know you, these who have never trusted you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for them right now that they would come up to me after service and pray to receive Jesus. I pray, Lord God, they don't leave here the same way they came in. I, Lord, life is too short. There are just too many enemies in our life. There's just too much going on. And Lord, it's my prayer, it's my cry, it's my plea to you, Lord God, that you would open the ears, open the eyes, take the calluses off, that someone may not only have a heart of stone today, Lord God, but that you would remove it and make it a heart of flesh. Lord, that you would move mightily and dramatically in someone's life for the praise of your glory.